welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at youtube.com slash cover3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook network. Thanks for hanging out. If you are watching live, hit that subscribe, smash that like, jump on in the chat, and this is a great day for you to jump in the chat because we are going to be taking some live audience questions throughout this episode. We do have some questions from the big old bag of mail loaded up and ready to go, but we are not going to turn our backs on you, the live viewers of the program. We have some questions of Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning. Uh, we're going to turn our attention to how a, a certain skill set or a certain body type might be able to help a college football player win a show like The Great Survivor. Uh, who might be a quarterback that could see another meteoric rise and much, much more? Uh, we are going to begin with Arch Manning. And this question does, by the way, come from the big old bag of mail, where if you leave us a five-star review and put that question in your review, we will throw it into uh, the big old bag of mail, tackle it in a future mailbag episode. Question is from Jay Riley. Uh, insert opening comment praising the pod, singling out one of y'all in particular. I recently had a debate with some friends about how good Arch Manning will be in college. This culminated with a wager that Arch Manning would or would not make a Heisman ceremony in a Texas uniform. And they said the odds were set at even money. My question for y'all, what odds would you post for Arch Manning to make a Heisman trophy ceremony in a Texas uniform at any point in his career? How would you do it at the cover three sports book? With Edgewood Emporium, the, the Edgewood Tom? Sportsbook and Entertainment Emporium. Uh, I would, I mean, what odds would I post or what odds would I bet? Because they're very different. Ooh. <laughs> I As, like the in a Texas uniform, by the way. That qualifies. Yeah. Incredible. Subtle. Yeah. Great. Right. See, see, as a sportsbook, he said that they have it at even odds. I would probably bet it at like minus odds. Like it would probably be maybe the standard minus 110, maybe minus 150, just because there is so much hype around Arch Manning for both his name and the fact that he's going to Texas, which is a huge fan base, that I think I could get a lot of suckers betting at those odds. Whereas I think the real odds, I would probably have closer to two to one or three to one. Because, I mean, he is the number one recruit in the class. He's the top rated quarterback and all that stuff is very important. But, like, if you go through the last few recruiting classes, the number one quarterback is not always at the... It's not always somebody who ends up being a Heisman. Like, yes, Bryce Young won a Heisman, highly rated QB, but DJU hasn't. Spencer Rattler hasn't. It's it's hard to be a Heisman finalist because not only do you have to put up monster numbers, but you have to put up monster numbers on a winning team for the most part. And I feel like now, these days, you have to be doing it on a team that's either winning your conference at a minimum or getting to the college football playoff, which limits the availability of spots. And I think that Arch Manning at Texas... I don't know that Texas has done enough to warrant being thinking they're going to get to a college football playoff in the next two or three years, even with Arch Manning. So I would I would say realistic odds plus 200 to plus 300 somewhere in there. Odds I would post, like I said, minus 150. Just to get there, right? Just to get to the yeah, ceremony. Just, mm -hmm. just not to be to win and there could be three finalists. There could be five finalists. You know, this that's another thing that has to be factored into your modeling of this. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I think if you put it at the book at minus. 110, 115, I think people would take it. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't take it. I'm with you. I'd probably want to see some plus value. I think plus 200 is probably what I would look for. Um, he's, I mean, he's going to have weapons. He's going to have an offense of mind. I think he's going to be legit. Like, I don't think it's going to be a flop. But we've. it's just still a crapshoot. You just don't know. I would, I would, I'm with you, Tom. I would probably not touch it unless it was plus 200 or maybe even plus 300. But I do think, I think he'll live up there. I think, I think he'll be, but I don't, uh, Eli never made it there, right? No. Not Peyton's as a finalist. there, but Eli never made it. I mean, he, and, but that was a tougher program at the time to get there. I mean, Texas, man, I mean, the opportunity if he does get him back, gosh. I hey. will say his odds are increased by his name, though, too. Yes, because, 100%. It helps. Yeah. Because, yeah, with Heisman voters, if he has a similar season to another quarterback who doesn't have a famous name, a lot of the casuals who still have Heisman votes will vote for the famous name. Mm -hmm. I, 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 like, if he is outstanding, 
and is among the like three or four most outstanding quarterbacks in the country, which based on potential and based on the way he's set up, he's going to win all those tiebreakers. There's only three spots on a Heisman ballot, and Arch Manning, if he is in the top five, is going to end up getting that second or third spot, even if he's not the like runaway, clear-cut number one favorite because of what you just said, Tom. I, I think even to... I might even take it at minus one ten. I mean, I get <laughs> three. You. I get three years of him in the in a Texas uniform. I laugh at it, but I'm just gonna. I'm I'm going to guess as we sit here right now. Do you now, get three years? Because I think if you sit, if he wants to get the clock started, get to the NFL, he sits oh, behind so Quinn Ewers, plays you know, plays a little bit, gets his feet wet, then he plays two, and then he bounces. You know, like that's why I don't. I think you might only see him two years. I wouldn't. It wouldn't surprise me. That's true. I will say, Chip, you shouldn't feel too bad about betting that minus one ten because it's that kind of thought process that gets you a comp room at the Edgewater Sportsbook and Entertainment Emporium. <laughs> what are the odds? What just kind of a throw in with a question? What would you put odds that he doesn't finish at Texas? Like plus a thousand. I think it's pretty. Yeah, long shot. I, don't I think, think it's a pretty long shot. I don't think he's planning. I I, I feel like. They, if he's choosing Texas now, I think he understands that he's not going to be the starter next year, or at least it's not the plan. It doesn't mean he totally. can't get the job. So I think that I don't, this doesn't strike me as a situation where he's going to be somebody who's like, well, I got to play right away. And if I'm not playing right away, I'm going to go looking for the best opportunity to play. But I don't think it's playing knows? time. I think it would be a coaching change. Yeah. I, which I mean, <laughs> which right. like Sark has a hell of a security blanket right now. Right. <laughs> yeah, you can fire me. You're going to lose him, but you yeah. can fire me. <laughs> like the the in a Texas uniform has less to do, I think, with playing time, um, as it does with the inst the um, habitual instability of the Texas football program in the modern era. Suggests that yeah, you can have a ton of talent, and you still might go five and seven. You still might go six and six, and if that happens. You know what does uh, Texas decide to do with Steve Sarkeesian? I do, I do think that Steve Sarkeesian is the head coach for Arch Manning's entire college career, and I think that Arch Manning, based on the the talent, based on the way that he will be set up as the figurehead of that offense, has a decent chance to finish top five in the Heisman voting in one of the two years that we would project he would be the starting quarterback for the Longhorns, but. One minus one ten might be a sucker. I like I like y'all's more like clear eyed view of uh of the situation. Where where would you guys set the odds for not for twenty twenty two but for twenty twenty three that Arch Manning enters the season as the Heisman favorite even though he hasn't started a game yet? <laughs> minus five hundred. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Alabama football money line kind of odds. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. something like that. Okay, let's uh let's go a little bit more um abstract here. Uh this question comes from Jake. Uh Jake, shout out to you. Uh which current college football player would you pick to win a survivor like competition? Shout out to Paramount Plus. <laughs> Do either of you guys watch Survivor? I have not watched as I have not watched recent seasons. You do, right? I used to. I haven't watched in a few years. Do you guys never great. send in a, you guys never send in an audition tape? <laughs> Please no. tell me. Have you? you? Somewhere there exists in a vault of probably after season one or two, a really cheesy, hey, I'm Danny Cannell, and I was an NFL quarterback, and I would be great for you. I mean, it was oh, bad. What could have been? Right. Uh, what could have been is right. Yeah. The memory, it was all the rage. I watched mm -hmm. the first few seasons, but after that, like kind of like the bachelor like i watched the jesse palmer bachelor like it was those shows were good but then it just got like okay we've seen the story already well there's so, new audiences that come to it like i know yeah, oh, yeah the machine's gonna keep going because it's a fantastic formula and it continues to rate very well i i have not uh i've not kept up with it but when i was trying to do my brainstorming i tried to also take into consideration the you you got to be someone who can who can make alliances right because there's a any one of these college football players that we'd be looking at might be uh, have a the physical profile to win all these challenges and get all the immunity, but you, you also got to be doing some wheeling and dealing to be able to win in Survivor. So who has uh, both the like physical advantages, the versatility, and also a little bit of the personality 
to be able to go in and uh, and survive this uh, this this game show. See, it's hard because like you, the big athletes from when I when I watch it, like there's always the big athlete guy who's strong and he helps the teams win all the competitions when they're still on a try. But then as soon as you get to the merge and everybody's on their own, those guys get cut so fast because nobody wants to be competing against them at all the events. So you can't really pick like the biggest, strongest football player you could think of. You Like you said, you have to pick somebody who could fit in. But at the same time, one of the reasons I've stopped watching the show is because it's become such a crapshoot where there are so many twists and powers that really it's just a roll of the dice every week as to who's going to go home. But I would go with somebody like Bryce Young, somebody in that vein who is athletic, who as a quarterback has leadership qualities who can you know rally the troops and get people behind him and following his plan but isn't such a giant athletic freak that he's going to be too intimidating to the other people in his tribe or on the show who will think all right well i could beat him in this if i absolutely have to so i think if i was going to pick a college player right now i would pick the heisman winner see i don't know if that works because if you're too like popular, they know you're a strong candidate. Then the other participants will oust you early, right? They're going to be like, no, this guy's too much of a favorite. We all need to get him out of here just to give us a chance. I think that's the route you would go there. I went the different route. Shout out, by the way, to our own David Sampson, who was a participant mm -hmm. on the show. First one out. I, think, uh, like, I guess all Coca does is produce podcasts featuring people who are either on Survivor or audition to be on Survivor. Site, right. <laughs> So I went the different way because there's always those people that, and I, this probably goes back to the first one. Wasn't it Richard Hatch? I think was his name. Yes. Um, and you had to be a little seedy. You had to kind of maybe show one way and, you know, go the other. So I had, had to be a transfer, you know, because if you're able to find another great opportunity after failing at a good one, then you kind of have to have some sort of, you got talent, but then already the reports you're hearing out, of the new school are great and changed, so you're fooling some people there, or you really have changed, one or the other. I went with Spencer Rattler. Oh! <laughs> and he's got five-star skills. You know, we've seen him out there. We've seen him do it. Then it didn't work out. You know, his teammates don't exactly love him, but now at South Carolina, they love him. They're all on board. So I think hey. he's got he's got some of that. He's got some of that in him. So bonus points for his reality television experience. He understands. Absolutely. He's he already understands played the game. The producers are looking <laughs> yeah. for. He understands how to play the game. Yeah. So when I was looking for my profile, I actually uh, landed on offensive linemen. You know, you've got to be selfless. You've got to be willing to be part of a team. You've got to be able to do a little bit of grunt work. I also needed some smarts. So the two names that came to mind, uh, number one, Jarrett Patterson from Notre Dame. You know, somebody who's going to be able to uh, see the entire field, uh, de designate where I need to be. And then the second one going all the way on the smarts, Peter Skoronsky from Northwestern. So mm. I wanted to get my offensive lineman just because of that selfless nature to the position where they would be able to uh, understand when it's time to take a step back and be able to, to bridge uh, those alliances that you need to win survivor. They're too big. No, but that's a good thing. Remember, that was the Richard Hatch philosophy. You come in big, and then you got a lot of fat to burn that you can kind of just – it's almost like a bear that hibernates. Yeah, you can just live off that fat. As you Richard, melt Hatch, off. Richard Hatch might have been fat, but first of all, that's another thing that's changed too. They used to starve those people out there. They no longer <laughs> starve them. They're eating every other day. They're all going on like big like prize things where they're getting steaks. But like he was fat sure but offensive linemen are huge and strong as well as fat so it's like they're going to be way too intimidating to the other contestants and if you want some old man survivor takes here you want me to yell out some clouds like you bring up spencer rattler because of his ability to maybe stab some people in the back problem with the kids these days is those people no longer win because these kids are voting with their feelings when they get to the jury if you hurt their feelings they are not going to vote for you they're going to vote for the person that was nicest to them not who played the best game that's one of the things that has driven me away wow mm -hmm. got Man. too soft mm -hmm. we need these kids these survivor kids are soft <laughs> shout out to uh ross brindle in the chat said will levis for the banana eating peel contest because i do remember that you had to eat all the wild crazy stuff mm -hmm. and like levis it's not only he does other foods besides the but he did some other weird like kind of what was it coffee with like mayonnaise in mayonnaise, it yes. yeah, yeah he, he'll oh. be willing to eat anything he'll be fine 
Yeah. <laughs> Forgot about that. Okay, because it was like the the SEC. He they would be on the SEC Network game, and then like one of their like prepackaged uh, specials or or one of their um, you know throwaway talking points was like, watch Will Levis and this crazy food eating. <laughs> does he? Does Will Levis even consider what he's doing to Alyssa Lang? What they're making her eat because That's of him? Right. That's right. <laughs> then, then Alyssa has to try. Oh yeah. my goodness, Emmy, Emmy for that. Uh, also, another uh, live viewer recommendation I'd liked is uh, Jake Hayner, which after we saw the way that man put his body on the line, <laughs> like I, I have a lot of confidence that uh, that he would do that. Um, long, that regular regular viewer short round. I, I appreciate that. that gets, was it UCLA that he was getting killed against? Yes. That yeah. was basically he played a season of Survivor in that game. <laughs> for the uh for the coaches only category, I would uh I would propose Todd Graham. <laughs> the the Russell Hansen coaches, yeah. Is it doesn't he get voted off real fast? Oh yeah. I, or does he play the game? Because he kept finding jobs. Now, I think they finally ran out, but man, <laughs> he had people going for a while. Uh Mike Gundy. I mean, the man does hunt rattlesnakes. Yeah. And yeah. also he has gotten himself uh he's he's gotten himself out of some tricky uh like social situations too and wound up on the other side. So I, I I think he could figure out a way to maneuver his uh maneuver his way through the game and be able to end up down near the end for sure. All right, let's go to this next question comes from Steve. Uh Jim Knowles' defenses at Duke and Oklahoma State took steps backwards in his first year before getting significantly better in later years. How quickly should we expect to see improvement in Ohio State's defense? Then a second part of the question, which offense this season will challenge the Buckeyes' defense the most? 2022 is when you could expect to see improvement in the Ohio State. I thought State it was defense. a good observation, though. I mean, he's, we're not dealing with the same talent, right? Like, I don't want to just miss entirely, the but the starting point is like you're dealing with Duke talent, you're dealing with Oklahoma State talent. Now we've got Ohio State talent, but mm -hmm. I still thought it was an interesting uh, premise in terms of like you know switching to the cover zero, the the aggressive style that he's got there. There could be a hiccup if against some of the better offenses. It's just the second part of the question. I don't know how many offenses are going to be able to really uh, challenge and present the kind of problems that would, uh, you know, create the the mismatch in communication. If there's any kind of, um, if there's anything for them to get adjusted to with the new scheme, I don't know how many offenses on the Buckeye schedule are going to be able to exploit that. Yeah, I, I, I think getting Notre Dame in the first week, I just don't know what the Notre Dame offense is going to look like just yet because we've talked about like the Irish don't have game breaking receivers. And I feel like that could, you know, that's the one weakness. I feel like if you were like with that aggressive style that they play, that's the one area I think that you could exploit them the most. But they don't, like you said, they don't really face that kind of team, which in an odd way, if you go through the schedule, the toughest opponent they might face, like I think Wisconsin can be physical with them and that could be problematic, but I don't think Wisconsin is going to have a bunch of big plays against them. So it shouldn't be a problem. Same with Iowa, maybe Penn State. But I think a team that kind of a dark horse that you could be surprised, especially from where it falls in the schedule, where it's like, oh, wow, this team put up 30 points on Ohio State, Maryland on the road. Yep. Because they have some dudes at receiver. They've got a QB who is not scared of trying any throw that he can. And I think that there's a chance that, you know, playing in Maryland the week before the Michigan game. Terps might be able to move the ball on Ohio State. It doesn't mean that I don't think they're going to stop them at all, but I think they'll be able to put the points on the board at least. Shocked you didn't say Northwestern with that. <laughs> Remember the what was it the the Big Ten championship game? That was the COVID year, right? Where they like yeah. came out the first half with this magnificent game plan, and they're like slicing them up. Um, I think you're right though. That's I just wonder if they have the dudes. Do they have the Chase Young? Do they have a Bosa, which I we haven't seen it yet, but does a Harrison evolve? Do one of these guys mature to a position where, okay, like there's the guy. And the secondary too, like where are the first round talent? Now maybe it's there and we just haven't seen it yet, but that to me is going to determine a lot of it. And then as far as the, the offense that challenges them, wow, like – if it, it may be if if like a Notre Dame and a Tommy Reese led system with an established quarterback, maybe, but that's mm -hmm. that's not gonna happen. They're gonna be cautious. 
I mean, Penn State, who's their quarterback going to be when they play them? I think it'll determine that, you know, like how we answer that question. I'm going to say it might be uh, Maryland. I agree, but man, Talia likes to throw those balls yes. up for grabs. Like, yes. I don't know about that. I think it might be Michigan again. Mm-hmm. You know, and Michigan by that time, who knows where they've evolved to that point in the season. But two, you know, dual threat, you know, two quarterback system that presents unique challenges. If they're still doing that, it's probably Michigan. I agree with you about the lack of the clear pass rusher that they've been missing the last years. But I think that's one of the things that makes Noel so attractive is because with his defense, he's able to manufacture pressure on quarterbacks. And he's been able to do that at Oklahoma State with guys who aren't exactly you're looking at is like, oh, that's that's a first round edge rusher right there. The um, the expectation is that Ohio State's defense should also have an incredible advantage playing on the opposite side of Ohio State's offense led by C.J. Stroud with Travion Henderson and Jackson Smith and Jigba and Emeka Buka and all of the players that we selected in the wide receiver draft and all of the offensive talent that we had, including offensive linemen that ended up having getting discussed uh, within the context of our Oklahoma drill draft as well. So it's, if they win, don't you think it'll be 2019 LSU type of team where yes. offense, like they got, you know, CJ Stroud is Joe Burrow. You got Jackson Smith and Jigba is the Jamar chase. Like you've got so many weapons to work with. And then the defense is good enough, not great, but just good enough. And that LSU defense, like much like the Ohio state defense had talent, right? right? You just need to be able to, flip the switch in the right game at the right time of the game to be able to get the stops that can just send a contest sliding the other direction in terms of leverage. And the Buckeyes hundred percent can't do that. All right, let's take it to speaking of Joe Burrow. All right. Uh, this question comes from Wesley, which quarterback has the best chance of a meteoric rise in the vein of Joe Burrow or more recently, Kenny Pickett that has them going from an after afterthought to a front runner in the Heisman Trophy voting and potentially the first quarterback taken in next year's draft. Love the show. I the last part of that, I don't think that exists. Oh, I, there's I, not a quarterback that you think is going to all of a sudden become be the first, first pick. Round. Okay. I think a Kenny Pickett late first round, maybe, and yeah. I even think that's really hard to find. Yeah, like Kenny Pickett only becomes the first QB taken because there was it was a terrible QB class. I don't see anybody being able to do it in a QB class that's going to have Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, et cetera, in it. It's but I do think there are guys who are candidates to have breakout years. I, I wrote about it last month. And I the way I approach it, like it's not just a guy who's gonna have a big year after not being great. I, I look at Kenny Pickett's situation as a guy who played for like four years. Mm. and he wasn't bad but he was you know he was what we call the jag plus type of guy where he was like he was good he just wasn't the kind of guy you're sitting there expecting to be a heisman finalist or put up huge numbers you just kind of a game manager sync type who suddenly explodes on the scene so for me if i'm going off of those parameters the obvious choice in my mind is sean clifford because he's been a starter for a few years has put up good but not great numbers and as I went over and when I wrote about it, this is he's coming back to Penn State. They lose Jahan Dotson, yes, but they're adding a terrific running back in the recruiting class who's going to help bring us a running game that they haven't had in a few years. Parker Washington is a good receiver. He's in an offense for the second straight year for the first time in his career. And I think one thing that you overlook with Joe Burrow and, and uh, Kenny Pickett is what else did they have in common? They had new play callers come in, change the offenses that they played in. Joe Brady helped Joe Burrow have that season. Last year, Mark Whipple helped Kenny Pickett have that season. This year, Mike Yersich, in his second season in a familiar offense, might be able to help Sean Clifford take that step forward offensively. And I think that he's the best one, but I do think there are other options. What do you guys think? I think it's funny because uh, I'm going to throw Jordan, our producer today, under the bus. He chimed in with Hendon Hooker. Hendon Hooker conference. just had a huge season. That's my point. I'm like, he should not be there. That's too easy. That, that's that's not an average quarterback elevating to greatness. I think he's already really, really good, and he could elevate to greatness by another year. He could be a you know first round pick. So I think like 
the question is very unique because I think it has to be like a Sean Clifford where you go, what are you talking about, Tom? There's no way he's going to be a top 15 mm -hmm. pick or a first round pick, but it actually happens. That's why I think Sean Clifford is a really good one. I think like Bo Nix, like mm. it was okay. Maybe he goes to Oregon, new life, balls out, you know, because he's against lesser competition and plays his way into a job. I looked also in the Pac-12 at a guy like DTR, Dorian Thompson Robinson, mm. like who's been a multi-year starter, played a lot better last year in like, but nobody really paid attention to it. But if UCLA puts together a nice, you know, if some things come together and they get nine or 10 wins, maybe they beat USC. I think he would be like the type of guy we're talking about where no one's projecting him as a first round pick. No one's projecting him in the draft. But a lot of playing time and just kind of if he takes that next step, it could be a, whoa, where did that guy come from? So two of my three are also transfers, which means that you're getting a new play caller, uh, Dylan Gabriel. Yeah. I think that Dylan Gabriel might be in the head He's had two good categories already, yeah. But He's had a, and his, one, his season at UCF was phenomenal, his freshman year. You're coming back from injury. When you yeah. stack these quarterbacks, they, it, he is not an afterthought, but he is an, oh, yeah, that guy kind of response. Uh, the other one that I had, another transfer, Keaton Slovis. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the guy Slovis, who plays his picket becomes the new picket. Yeah, Slovis at his best at USC was very, very good. You know, he's got a lot of experience, and if he can put it all together, then uh, I think you could see him do it. And then the third one I had on here, Sam Hartman. Mm -hmm. I don't think he'll go to number one. But he's already put up great numbers. I think he's an afterthought. Yeah, I'll give you one and shout out. And this is a little bit of a homer pick, but this is one where you guys be like, you're crazy. Shout out the blue chicken, put him in the chat. Jordan Travis of Florida State, like, no, and I, I am not projecting this, but the similarities for Joe Burrow would be back into the season played a lot. Like when Joe Burrow first got to LSU, it was really shaky, didn't play. And then he kind of, you talked to him, he's like, I started to feel better towards the back end of that first season. Jordan Travis, last five or six games for Florida State, stopped turning the ball over, you know, protected it better. Running and passing stats combined were pretty impressive. I don't think he's a first-round talent as a thrower, but I think as a put-it-together, and this is what Florida State fans are, you know, praying for every night, is that he does put it together. I think he could be somebody that, if it all comes together, he could burst on the scene. Yeah, and in the thing I wrote last month, I had five guys. I had Clifford and Chip, like you. I had Kadan Slovis and Sam Hartman. Two other guys, I think, that can fit this category. Spencer Sanders. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good one. Tanner Morgan. Uh, Another good one. Jordan Jordan pointed out in our in our private chat. Somebody, you know, shout out Coca. Uh, J T Daniels could oh. fit this mold as somebody who breaks free and has a big season. There's there are guys. There's plenty of viable candidates. It's just, I think the odds of any of them doing it are pretty low. Agreed. Which is Coming why they should be low. That's why we're talking. Mm -hmm. Like that's why it fits this topic perfectly. Because last year, if any one of us was said Kenny Pickett, be like, eh, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, Kenny Pickett's all right. Well, yeah. Barton Barton was yelling it for like three years, but so <laughs> that's impressive. He, he was more in on Addison. I yeah, think. I know. But he was he time. liked Barton. Always liked Kenny Pickett, though. He always liked it. Let's pause. Yeah. <laughs> gloves uh <laughs> coming up on the other side uh we will continue to roll through our mailbag questions and we will begin to take questions from you the live audience so go ahead and chime in drop your question we will start throwing them up on the screen and breaking them down all that and more next all right let's start with from franklin uh what do y'all think can Wisconsin make it to the playoff if, if it is not quarterback play? So what do you think if Wisconsin not, yeah. can make it to the playoff without good quarterback play? Yes, but they won't. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, Wisconsin's it's the four. We know the formula for Wisconsin. We know what it's going to be. It's they're going to have a fantastic defense. They're going to be able to run the ball. And if, Graham Mertz suddenly lives up to the hype that he had coming out of high school. And then in that very first game that he in the COVID year against Illinois, then yeah, I mean, Wisconsin is capable of beating Ohio state, but I don't think it's just going to be quarterback play. Like even if Graham Mertz plays well, 
can you reliably trust Wisconsin to beat Ohio State in a Big Ten championship, which is what they would have to do realistically to get to the playoff? I don't think so because there's just such a huge talent advantage. So if Wisconsin doesn't get to the playoff, it would just be the talent disadvantage it's at overall more than anything else. I think they need a quarterback. I think they need dynamic quarterback play. I thought Graham Mertz after the Illinois game, wasn't that Illinois? He had five touchdowns. Child, yeah. I don't want to bring I don't, that game I, up. I, I, he had like four more touchdowns and incompletions in that game. Yeah. And, but I was, everybody was excited. I was on board. Hey, this is the best quarterback since Russell Wilson. I think that's what they need is a Russell Wilson type quarterback um, to help them elevate. I just think you have to have dynamic quarterback play unless you have a defense with five first rounders and a team with 15 draft picks. <laughs> and also shout out to Zext in the, ch in the chat who also points out Wisconsin doesn't have good wide receivers either. It's not yeah. just the quarterback. That's part of the equation too. Yeah. The expl explosive plays as a, but Elliot's not here right now, but I got to talk about explosive plays just to make sure that his spirit and his essence is well represented when it comes uh, to something of that expertise, but there are just not a lot of explosive plays in the way that the Wisconsin approaches its offense. And so, yes, they, they need a new quarterback, but they also need options on the outside. That doesn't mean good tight end. They'll always give you a good tight end, but they need dynamic playmakers that are going to stress a defense on the outside. And that's been something that uh, has been a little bit tough. There's players who've been good, who like, like Danny Davis comes to mind, right? Like you, you can think about, Maybe I'm off the top of my head, I'm thinking more of like possession receivers. I'm thinking about somebody who can be a reliable pass catcher, but those really elite wide receivers seem to be something that uh, has not always been there in Madison. All right, now let's go uh, back into the big old bag of mail. Continue to fill up uh, the chat with those questions. We'll tackle a couple of them before we get out of here. This one's a little bit personal, so let's, let's have some fun and uh, let people in a little bit. Two questions. Uh, that both are along the same line. The first one comes from RJ. It says, if you had to cover a sport or a team that isn't football, what would you choose? And then Chet asks, if sports media didn't exist, what would each of you be doing for a living? Hmm. I would definitely be covering college baseball. Um, I did at ESPN for a while. I covered probably six years in a row. I did called baseball games for them, did some regionals and super regionals. Uh, I think baseball, college baseball is one of like the most, and it's, it's hardest because right now it feels like it's fresh in our minds because we just watched it, but it really is a ton of fun, man. There's some great ballparks and there's a massive, massive difference in calling college baseball with college football, you know, like college football, you're so dialed in, you, you like, you just got to be in on every play ready to diagnose it. You know, you can be having a conversation about the restaurant you ate in last night, and then it's you know, oh, here's a drive into deep left by Castellanos. Like, <laughs> yeah, like it's just, it's just very like seamless, and then all of a sudden it's back right back to whatever you were doing. Um, but yeah, I, I love uh, love baseball, so I'd probably be covering baseball if there was another sport. Uh, I don't think I would be covering a college sport. I think I would probably go pro. Uh... It depends. Like, am I cover if I'm covering it nationally? I would prefer to cover baseball. If wow. I were doing like a local beat, I would probably cover the NBA. Like, I, I the thing with baseball, like, I, I feel like I wouldn't want to be a beat writer for baseball because the season is so long. Mm -hmm. But at least nationally, you don't have to be traveling because, like, the NBA, the season is shorter, but it never ends. Like the off season is just as important in the NBA as it is the regular season. As far as news goes, as far as covering the league, there's so much non basketball stuff surrounding it. So I think nationally I would rather be baseball because it's more relaxed. Golf. Um, oh, I, will, I was the, uh, I was the host of the first cut podcast with Kyle Porter when it originally launched. I really enjoyed it. I still but jumped you hated in. Kyle. So you were like, hire somebody else. <laughs> no, real. I, I said this and, uh, and people didn't believe me. They they were like, no, no, we need we need somebody who really knows golf. And they went and hired Rick Kamen. <laughs> they were like, we because I mean it, there there's only but so many like hours in a day that you can spend. And I'm trying to bring my like very best to the Cover Three podcast, to college football, to you know I I cannot dedicate all of the time that is needed to be able to fully cover it. But I you do give up the fact that you are going to be covering a sport that only takes place on the weekends. That is tough. 
but this is the deal breaker for me, especially just sort of where I'm at right now. They don't play in the dark. Like they, <laughs> those tournaments are done. If you're okay with waking up early in the morning and, but then having an actual bedtime that is, that is much preferable to like major league baseball will keep you up odd hours. You know, NBA certainly will keep you up real late at night, but, but golf just gets it done in the daytime and then taking care of business sunsets, go eat dinner and you're ready to go. Uh, covering golf tournaments in person is also amazing. Uh, I'm, the experience of being inside the ropes is stupid. I can't believe that they still allow it. And it's awesome. Uh, it, it is a great way to just be like right there, totally absorbed in the competition. Very few uh, media experiences for me have matched that. So I'd, I'd probably go with golf. I might trade baseball, college baseball for golf. I might jump in there with yeah. you. Like you have to, again, it's tough because you are going to be working like pretty much every Saturday and Sunday, or maybe mm -hmm. you're able to, you know, switch something out. But that's no different than it is now for us. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, let's. What see. would no? What would you be doing if you didn't work in sports media? Oh, mm. I was pre med my first two years at Florida State. My dad's a doctor. I would like to think I would have pushed through. Like I and in play, playing two sports and doing like chemistry labs was just way too much. Yeah. My dad's still alive. He's still working. Like I, I love what he does. I would like to think I could have persevered through eight years of school and a residency. That's a long time. Man, it is a long time. <laughs> but I probably like if sports weren't an option, I probably would have kept down that road. I was uh, working for a music festival for a couple of years, and I did a little bit of like band managing band booking but i was awful at it so it would not be that but it would be something else related i just like event planning being able to like invest all like getting sponsors getting uh like all the logistics and the management that's needed to be able to put on a big event promote a big event you know go on different radio stations and television shows and tell them why you got to come to this big event like i was I was, I was pretty good at being a hype man, being somebody who can work with a team. And so I'd, I'd say it's probably in that – it's probably the same kind of staffing that is like not sports media, but you are working for a bowl game. That's it. I wouldn't be in sports media. I'd be wearing the blazer. I'd be wearing yep. the colorful blazer and putting on three games a year, and that would be my full-time job. Would you be belt ball? What's the closest? Was There's no no. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Charlotte way. Charlotte Sports Consortium also has some of my peeps there, so I, I would there. definitely have to uh, Duke's Mayo Bowl. I would definitely yeah. have oh, to yeah. be <laughs> Duke's, Duke's, Duke's Mayo. Bowl, you sure. would have been negotiating all these big time contracts with all the people, but then you could have run their social media. Would have done a great job. They're already good at that. But you could even be even better. Yeah, I would have had to deal with the crisis management when the Mississippi State player shoplifted on <laughs> the shopping spree. <laughs> you were given a gift card. And you were still shot. I mean, I'm. Yeah. Hey, Tom, what would you what would you do? I would be writing, but just not about sports. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, I would be a five star wedding planner. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. No All right. Uh, let's go to Tin Horn Productions. Asked, can Clay Helton take Georgia Southern back to a Sun Belt championship? No. And I'm saying no because of the Sun Belt. It's yeah. tough. You got App State, you got Coastal Carolina, you got Louisiana, you were getting James Madison, you were getting Marshall. Like the Sun Belt is really, really tough. If Clay Helton has Georgia Southern in the mix for Sun Belt titles, but especially the oh, Georgia State has been on the upswing recently too. It's an uphill climb in the East Division. I don't know what Sun Belt's plan is with divisions moving forward off the top of my head, but I I think that's more about the Sun Belt than it is about me, you know, being out on Clay Helton. But the answer is no. For me, it's much more basic than that. If he couldn't win the Pac-12 with USC, why should I expect him to win the Sun Belt with Georgia Southern? And he did win the Pac-12. Didn't he? You think he won it once? Yeah. Got so, to a one Pac-12 championship. Yeah. Okay. So that's not fair. But I still, it's hard. It's I. I think that I think Georgia Southern is a better fit for him because I don't think he is the kind of recruiting star chaser type that you need to compete at USC and he's a more of a developmental coach. So I think it's maybe, yeah, it's unfair to say he can't win a conference title in the Sun Belt at Georgia Southern. I just don't expect him to. Anytime soon too. I mean, that mm -hmm. doesn't look like any app state coastal. None of these programs are slowing down. All right, let's go to 
This next question comes from Short Round. Who is the next blue blood to become an afterthought? Or to phrase it another way, who's going to become the next Nebraska? Oh, God. This is going to be hell. Well, well, no, but I I was saying thank you for not calling it Florida State. State. Because I think you could already say. So 13 13 national championship, 14 playoff appearance. Like that's nine years away from the national championship. But it's but, Rocky. We're on. Yeah, front. no, it's definitely the most. It's the, definitely a candidate in this conversation. It's for not sure. where I was going. Ooh, where, where are you going? going? Does your co-host watch this show, Danny? Oh, am I going to get? Am I going to be getting it off, yelled at? Jordan? Get the get get clip it off. Get this ready for a little social. Oklahoma. I think that like what's part of Nebraska's problem? Nebraska, when it was last in the Big 12, was playing for Big 12 titles. It was competing in the Big 12 North. It left for the Big 10. It went to a new home where it's not exactly... I mean, I feel like it's a cultural fit, but the way Nebraska built its program was on recruiting areas of the country where it's no longer really has as much easy access to recruiting, and it's had to kind of reset itself in the Midwest. And it's kind of fallen behind, and it's had problems doing so. Now Oklahoma is leaving the conference where it's had all its success. And I know it's switched the names of the conference, but it's pretty much been the same teams it's been playing against for a long, long time. Now it's going to the SEC where it is going to be competing against teams that are much better than the teams it's currently competing against for the most part in the Big 12. So this is a team that has gone to a playoff a number of times in the last since the playoff was you know created. It went to BCS title games. It won a BCS national title. I don't think it's going to be able to do that in the SEC. I think that once Oklahoma gets to the SEC, it's more likely to be an eight and four, nine and three team every single season than a team that's winning national title. So I don't think Oklahoma is going to be a blue blood for too much longer after it joins the SEC. It totally, everything you said makes sense. Um, do you see their win total this year, by the way, where win totals are coming up? Aren't they at eight and a half, maybe nine? Like, so they're already projecting a little bit of a setback. I don't know if you guys paid much attention to this because I think Oklahoma and Texas fans are like, we're rabid fan bases. We're ready to go. Like, we can go toe-to-toe with the SEC. We're going to fit right in. Did you guys watch the College World Series final? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was Ole Miss and Oklahoma. Ole Miss had 90%. I am not – ask any baseball fan. 90% of the stadium in Omaha was Ole Miss fans. And, like, I thought that was a – like – that's the difference in SEC versus Big 12, not even Oklahoma specifically. I mean, it was not even close. And Oklahoma is closer by any level. Like if you look at where the alums live, where the, where the campus is, it's like 450 miles. I did this because I was trolling Dusty with this. It's like 450 miles from Norman to Omaha, and it's like 900 from Oxford to Omaha, and yet the Ole Miss fans came in droves. And if you want to do the jello shots, don't even get started because it was 18,000 to like 900. I don't even know if Oklahoma made it in triple digits. I just, it's, I know Oklahoma, Texas, and I think they'll be okay. I don't think it's an indictment on whether they succeed in football or not. It is a different, it is, I think it's a good suggestion. I think it's a good candidate for this topic. Okay. Let's, I want to, huh? college football playoff rant Ole Miss winning the college world series is what everybody wants the college football playoff to be a team that didn't even have a winning record in its conference gets chosen to play in the tournament and then gets hot and goes on and wins the entire last team in the field yeah last team in the field that's what we want yep and let's but let's people say that's great but then we'll compare the college world series television ratings to the college football playoff and you tell me what people really want but they're different sports like you could exactly. have, you could have had Tennessee, who was the number one team, play against the number two team, who I forget who it was, maybe Virginia Tech or Stanford. Yeah, no, base, baseball would not is have much rated. More. It wouldn't have rated if you had the top two powerhouses mm-hmm. from all season long. I think it's great. I was one of the ones who put that out there. No, I don't want a sixty-four team field. I get they're two different sports, but I think you could see in a twelve or sixteen team field once every decade maybe once every 15 years a team that sneaks in and i don't think i i was thinking ucf from 2017 i don't think it's that i think it's more of like a power five school maybe an sec school that sneaks in 
figured out its quarterback, gets hot, and they knock off one of the power five, you know, one of the yeah. favorites, number one or number two seeds. But I think that would be awesome. It we got to so ex- expand the playoff to get four and five SEC teams in. But yeah. like, I just think like, ba- basketball and baseball college, the postseason suits for Cinderella's in college football. Cinderella lives in the regular season, but people just don't want to accept it because that's not what they're used to. It's going to be Texas. And it's going to be led by Arch Manning. That old underdog story of Texas and a Manning (laughs) leading the Longhorns, Uh, though he'll probably be in the NFL by the time the college football playoff expands. Who's your blue blood that's going to beat Nebraska, though? I was going to say Florida State. Oh, okay. Wow, Danny, you're going to just let him get away with that. (laughs) No, I I was surprised it wasn't in the question. Like, But I I do, like, it's – I think any – like, the ACC money is an issue. Florida State doesn't have a John Ruiz right now at the moment. I'm trying to hit up the uh we'll see. Up Danny Canell. We'll, we'll see how yeah, we'll Sarah see how Blakely, Bud I does. believe is her name. We need we'll a billion dozen locks this year. Yeah. But it's been shaky ground. You're right. Like it is. I I I worry about it for Florida well, State. And the like, other thing is, you know, it takes for me, I'm always like, how many generations? Like, actually, it starts with how many four year cycles? Who finishes their entire experience at Florida State without being at the top? And then how many four-year cycles? And then how many 10-year cycles? And the further that you get from it without being able to um, you know, show proof of this being one of the best programs in the entire country, the more everyone just kind of gets used to it. And when everyone gets used to it, then you lose the hunger, and that's when it's going to be harder to get the investment. And even more specifically, the recruits start to get used to it. And the recruits are getting, you know, they don't remember nine years ago, Florida State win a national championship. They remember, you know, Florida State getting beat by Jacksonville State. Like, that's what they remember. So I think that's, I think this year is ma- massive. I mean, it doesn't need to be said, but I like Mike Norvell, like the, like the direction he's headed in, but you need to capture some momentum so that you can go from top 20 recruiting class to after this season, if you get eight wins, get a better bowl, get something impre- like some signature win where you can elevate that to a top 12 recruiting class. Can you parlay that into a top? Like it, but it is a crucial juncture because if you fire Mike Norvell, then you get in this cycle of coaching turnover, which you've seen at Nebraska, you've seen at Miami, you've seen at Texas, all these other blue bloods who are down, you know, down trying to get back. You don't want to get into a cycle of hiring and firing coaches or else that's going to make it only that much harder. All right. Let's see. We've got, there was a, there was a mailbag question that was wondering if it was possible for us to go an episode without bringing up something Illinois or Illinois adjacent. The answer is no, because we've got a question coming from the live chat. Uh, Zex asked, does Tom believe (laughs) Bielema can get Illinois back to the Zook level? Yeah. Yeah. Because the Zook level, I mean, there was the Rose Bowl trip, and there were a couple bowl games, but it's not like Illinois was killing people during the Zook era. They just had a couple of good seasons. I, I think Brett Bielamo can get Illinois to a position where it's consistently going to bowl games, which, please, because that has never been the case. <laughs> since, <laughs> I mean, since I, since I started, since I became college age and started actually caring about Illinois football, which was a while ago they have been to five bowl games <laughs> they've only once gone to a bowl game in consecutive seasons in the 20 years that i've been caring so yeah and that includes ron zook who by the way in his one two three four five six seven years went to three bowl games but he only coached two of them because the fight hunger bowl which we beat ucla zook was not the coach he'd been fired it was under an interim vic caning at the time so yeah, I, I definitely think Brett Bielema can get him to the Zook level because the Zook level wasn't that great. Okay. Would uh, Danny, would you fire Norvell today to hire Urban Meyer? No. I wouldn't even think about it. There's too much baggage. You know, I mean, it, it maybe if you've hired him away from Fox last year, and that was, I don't know, it's just, and plus it wasn't real realistic to me. I don't think he would do that within the state, but I mean, yeah, I, I think it's a no brainer before all his issues at Jacksonville. Don't you guys, I mean, don't you think just, Oh, I would hire him in a heartbeat. No offense yeah. to Mike Norvell. Right. I, I don't, I don't think it should be heartbeat. Heartbeat. Would you do yeah. it today? Even with yes. the baggage? Oh God. Yeah. I don't care really? about Jacksonville. 
this is college. We've seen guys go to the NFL and just screw up and do terrible and then come back and have great college success. There's a guy in Alabama who did it. So, no, I would hire Urban in a heartbeat if yeah, I was Yeah, but Florida it wasn't. State. It wasn't like Saban's tenure with the Dolphins was different and, yeah. and anything we saw. Like that was maybe the worst coaching tenure of the last 20, 30 years in the NFL. What we saw transpire but, with Urban. But the person Urban was at Jacksonville, was he that any different than the person he was at Ohio True. State? Coaching or style Florida, different. Or right? Utah? But it's I do think now today's player is, I think the further Urban has, the longer Urban has been out, the less his style of coaching works. If that makes sense. Like he's, he's he was that iron fist. I'm gonna, you know, the all these players are more not only are they getting paid, but they're starting to act like NFL players as well. And there's players are starting to evolve and you know, hey, whatever the coach says goes into well, I don't know, coach. Why? Why are we doing this? You know, like, I, I think Urban would give Florida State's athletic department a kick in the butt. Hmm. I think he would stress me out. <laughs> if, I was, if I was working in that athletic department, I'd be stressed out. What always. a massive troll job for the Gators, though. That would that would almost that's be that's the other part it. of it too. Because now, like you're if you start winning at Florida State with Urban Meyer, Florida fans are just be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, before we get out of here, now, holiday weekend. Any any big plans? What what are we up to? None. <laughs> I'm waiting. I, as we talked about before the show, I'm waiting for the Friday evening news dump on Deshaun Watson, and I'm hoping Danny is not home when it happens. <laughs> exactly. I am headed on vacation. Let's go. There we go. I'm going to North Carolina to Cashers up there in the mountains. Let's go. Give me some cool weather. Give me some time on the lake, a little tubing with the kids, some cold beer, some barbecue, and much needed a little rest. Can't awesome. wait. Yeah. Awesome. And then, uh, and then what you got? Uh, I'll be going to Pinehurst for a couple nights. There's a there's like a limit with the two children under the age of two, like too many nights away. We're just like I I need to be like in in my home stadium to be able yeah. to like handle everything. So when we go on the road, I try to limit it to just a couple nights. Over July fourth, like what third, fourth, second, third, fourth. You know, yeah. uh, the reason I ask is there's a massive junior golf tournament that takes place at Pinehurst. The North South Amateur. Go no, the U.S. kids like world championships. So if you see like a thousand or more kids running around, you know what they're doing. Oh yeah, and we've uh, it, it's awesome because then you just you let the two year old just run away, right? <laughs> There's enough parents around that right. someone will grab him if he like gets too point. much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Danny Canale. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Thanks to all of you who submitted your questions either through the big old bag of mail or joined us live. Have a great holiday weekend, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great fourth.